But by the power of the Holy Spirit, above all, we can maintain constant, fervent love for one another. Because you know what the greatest way is that I sh show that I love God? Is by loving my brother and sister who I see. And then it actually shows I love my God who I don't physically see at this moment. That's the greatest way I show I love God is by loving you and you each other and loving me. And then he goes on to tell us in verse 9, he says, Be hospitable to one another without complaining. God's calling us to be hospitable, to love one another, practically speaking. One of the things I loved in some of the meetings and just conversations I have with many of you is that you're trying to learn how to live out hospitality. That doesn't mean you make a big banquet feast at your dining table. Well, that can be it. There's so many ways to be hospitable, not only here. You know what the reason for our coffee bar is back there in the morning with our baked goods and our coffee? We just want to show a small snapshot of hospitality so the guard can come down to know you're welcome, to know you're loved. I know that sounds simple, but it makes an impact that, man, you can come in, especially if you're here for the first time or the first time in a while, it probably was uncomfortable coming in this door. And I get it, because that's been me a few times in my life. Man, you go into the doors of a church building for the first time, and you're like, oh, man, I don't know these people. They don't know me. And say, hey, we're glad you're here. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Would you like a donut? And that may seem simple, but there's something powerful about hospitality. And so many of you are learning to live that out in your lives, in your neighborhoods, in your community, in your villages. And it's such a powerful point. I was able to be a, a recipient of hospitality of a family in this church just uh, about a week or so ago. And they were sitting with, had another, some friends that had not yet come to Christ. And we had the most beautiful conversation over burgers. And it was a great time together. Let me tell you this. I want to get real theological about hospitality for a moment. The book of Acts in the New Testament, the most underrated vehicle for evangelism is hospitality. I think we miss that as we read Acts and as we read the epistles that hospitality in that Near Eastern culture was huge in that day. We don't even understand how big hospitality was, how important it was for those travelers and the danger of that day for being hospitable to specifically brothers and sisters, but to others when appropriate. But for us today, we've lost that because we're an individualistic society that when we figure out, Lord, in this context, how do you want me to live out hospitality? Maybe you have a small one-bedroom apartment. Maybe you have a huge house or anywhere in between. It, that's not the point. It doesn't matter if you're a great cook or not. Well, I like it if you got good cooking. That's really not the point of hospitality. Can we make somebody feel welcome and respect them where they're at? Whether it's a simple cup of coffee or whether it's a sandwich or whether it's a big meal, it doesn't matter, but we sit and we spend time with someone and we show them hospitality. I believe hospitality to still today in 2024 with such a crazy culture we're living in, I believe hospitality is the greatest vehicle for evangelism today as well as it was in the first century. And when this church, as we continue to learn how to develop that personally and collectively, oh, God works in a great way. So he tells us to be hospitable to one another without complaining. And so do that and know that God will bless and so we're to love one another and show hospitality to one another. And so let me share this with you as we talk about what God is telling us to show love, to be hospitable. He goes into verse 10, he says this, Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards or managers of the very grace of God. Do you know that if you're here today and you have turned from your sin and trust Christ, you have a grace gift, a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit that He wants to use you and however He's gifted you to serve the kingdom of God and serve the local church family. And so if you're not engaging whatever the gifting God has given you, you're missing out on some great blessings. And so He's telling us just as we have received a gift, that meaning a spiritual gift, use it to serve others as good stewards or managers of the very grace of God. And so each one has received a gift. We need to use it to serve others. And the reality is you and I are not owners of anything. You and I are only managers. And managers don't own, but they are responsible for what they're over. And God has given us a variety of gifts in this church family for everything we need. I was thinking of this week, um, a family that was it's in this church family that years ago they were having a Bible study, and the husband said, something along the lines in this Bible study years ago. He said, everything he had belongs to Jesus. He said, even if the Lord took away their home, it was already his to begin with. 
And a few days later, their, their home burnt down. And I remember getting the call, and I went to that house with the house burnt to the ground, and the family had only escaped with their lives and you know, their undershirts and pair of shorts on. They were out there with nothing. And I hugged them and cried with them, and we walked together. That was a powerful moment in my life. I remember as I saw the smoke rolling across the road as I turned into their home. His family escaped, and they realized that as the church rallied around them, that they were only managers of what God had given them. It reminds me of this. There's a man, a great theologian named John Wesley. John Wesley's own house burnt down to the ground. Some people had found him one day, and John was not near his home. And they said, John, we're so sorry to tell you this. Your house just burned to the ground. And John Wesley said, that's impossible. And they said, no, John, your house really burned to the ground. And John Wesley said, no, that's impossible. And they said, no, we saw it with our own eyes. Your house is gone. And once again, John Wesley said, no, that's, that's impossible. You see, I don't own a house, John Wesley said. God gave me a place to live in. I only manage that house for him. If he didn't put the fire out, then that's his problem. He'll have to put me somewhere else. He understood, John Wesley understood, he understood that he could have something and use it without actually possessing it. He didn't hold on to it so tightly that when it went down, he went down too. Do you know that some of us in this room today would lose our ever-loving minds if we lost our house or our car or something like that? When we realize we don't possess anything, it makes life a lot easier when the tough times come. All of our gifts, our spiritual gifts, our physical gifts, even the gift of breath we have, health, life, they're all from God. We own nothing. So we manage the gifts we've been entrusted with for the kingdom of God. Everything belongs to Him, not you, not me. Each of the gifts we have are temporary, and they'll be taken away one day. Whether they're physical gifts and even our spiritual gifts will be changed in eternity. But for the committed believer, they'll be replaced with eternal dividends. That's what we need to realize, that the spiritual giftings you've been given to serve others now will one day be replaced with a response of eternal dividends. So for the lazy believer, and I've been in that category before, and I say that with a heavy heart, you'll only be saved so as by fire if you really know Christ. For the unbeliever, everything will be destroyed by fire, and even more for them, eternal fire. But for us, God's calling us to be good managers where we are, that we've all received a gift, and we need to use our giftings to serve one another. We're going to talk about that more next week. But as we serve, our highest motivation needs to be love. Let me give you a story to drive this home. There was a husband and a wife, and one day they were arguing. You and your spouse have never argued, have you? They were really going at it, and so the wife suggested that they write down all their complaints on a piece of paper about one another, exactly how they felt. That could be dangerous, right? She thought about it. She might cut down on the bickering. So the husband agreed, and he got the paper, and they got out the pencils, and they started writing, and they both started writing. They both furiously wrote for a while. The husband would pause. He'd look at his wife, and he'd write some more. The wife would pause. She'd look up at her husband and write a few more things. She was irritated about him. The husband paused again. He looked at the wife, even more angry next time. Then he'd start writing some more. And so it went back and forth, and the wife finally put her pencil down, and the husband kept on writing. He looked at, at her. He was angry, and he was writing, and he kept writing, and he wrote some more, and then he wrote some more. Then at that point, after the wife had got done, she was ticked. He kept on writing. like she, He kept going down the page, man. She stopped a long time ago. He actually turned the paper over and started writing on the back side of the page. You know this is going to be bad, right? He kept looking at her, and he came up with more to write. Every time he looked up, something new would come up, and he'd write something more. At that point, the wife went from angry to broken and hurt, and she didn't know how could he keep doing this. She was clenching her fist, and she was starting to cry as he kept doing this. Finally, the husband was finished. They exchanged sheets of paper and looked at each other's sheets. As soon as she gave him her sheet and looked at his, she actually felt terrible. She wanted her sheet back at that point because when she looked at her husband's sheet of paper, in spite of his anger and in spite of his pain, 
He had written on every line, I love you. Even when I'm angry, I love you. I love you. I'm ticked off, but I love you. (laughs) I'm angry, but I love you. I don't want to be here right now, but I love you. And when she saw that much love, it covered the multitude of sins that had brought up the argument in the first place. You see, when you and I, when we love one another like that, whether it's our spouses or our children or our eternal church family, that kind of love covers up a multitude of sins. 